All right, guys, James, you had mentioned before we went to air that uh, you looked over this uh, article from, was it uh, Andrea Adelson? Yeah. Um, okay, at ESPN. I have yet to look at that, uh, but uh, your impressions and then uh, George, uh, I believe you also saw it as well. You know, she's an op. I want to call her that because she's still a part of that group that was, you know, she didn't stand up for us when it mattered, but it was still very um I thought I had it um saved or, or retweeted it, but it was um it was you know she shared in her in her tweet um or in her article, excuse me, what Mike said um to the team. And it was about um you know, overcoming things, climbing, still climbing, um, you know, you know, not letting this kind of define them, define the team. But the whole concept of the article, and we've seen a lot of people go back and forth. We've seen the 63, 63 to three, um, uh, you know, the trolls um, to no end. But nobody's ever quite came out and said, hey, what does what do those guys really feel like? Like because and that would have been a great article. The only things, and this is why I do believe that, as much as like Kirk Herbstreit will give kind of a veiled attempt at, a, at an apology or other guys, the reason why I think it still hurts so bad is that nobody ever tried to talk about what the other side was. Like I'll use for example, right now you've got um, like not even a fight back. I don't, and that's not just ESPN. I blame FSU media as well. Um, the first thing that should have happened should have been. 247, the 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 247 knows on three knows or war, excuse me, war chant. All these guys should have been like doing some pieces, not just asking the players what their initial thoughts were after the hurt, but like what is life after that picking up, picking up where you were placed at. Um, and I and I say this like, you know, and I saw you kind of like obviously it's the talk of the town. You see people come out and say that, you know, LSU ditch the national anthem but then you saw lsu media immediately address that hey they just this is their pre-game routine they weren't protesting they just said pre whether you believe it or not somebody actually tried to speak from their from their side you see caitlin clark um people say something about her complaining but then you see somebody talk about the other side of her being a competitor you see angel, angel reese i'm saying these things to say that like, i've not seen espn do anything other than say florida state didn't deserve to be in it which I think is a really good kind of too little, not too little too late, but I think I thought it was interesting because even as a guy who was just mad that they didn't get a chance to go, I never thought about what is it, how does a head coach motivate his guys to go into a bowl game? How does he motivate them going into the next season? How do you motivate yourself? And that's really um, what the gist of the article was. And, and again, like I said, my initial impressions were, that it's pretty good. I mean, I like the I, I like the like where it was going, and you know, obviously, it's still game still got to be played. You can't cancel the season, but I thought it was awesome. So, yeah. before George, before you go uh, on this one, I have a question for both of you. So, James, you said that Kirk Herb Street had mentioned that he was going to apologize, or what? What was that? What what what's he? he I would have to ask what what's he apologizing for? Is oh, he apologizing yeah. because he thinks he made a mistake about who should have been in the playoff, or that he misrepresented Florida State season, or it was more so FSU fans light 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 him up every time they get a chance, and he's like, "I'm sorry if I've done anything to offend the fan base. That's not my intentions." He wasn't saying he's sorry for not thinking Florida State should have belonged. Okay. He's like more so apologizing because I didn't mean you guys. I didn't mean to offend you guys and for you to take it in the manner in which you took it. So um, that's kind of where where that came from. But even then, it's still kind of I I don't I don't again no FSU. I don't think he can say anything that's going to make FSU fans just like him all over the top. But I do think if they would have started with, not started with, if they would have begun like, okay, Florida State's gone. They're out of it. It's not our, 
it's not our job as an unbiased media source to defend or to attack what the college football playoff does. We can have a critique of what we think the teams are going to do in the decisions, but we don't need to back our decision every week. But I think if, if they would have led with what Andrea just did, I actually think it might not be as bad. He wouldn't get the vitriol. The problem is not only did Kirk, like, like Kirk defended the decision like it was his decision to make at every given chance. And I even called – the only time I've ever called Kirk out was you said what you said. Like, one, like and he's responding to the guys with 20 followers. I'm like, bro, you said what you said. Stop arguing. Now I'm starting to believe you feel guilty because you keep attacking. Because, like, if you believe that they should – I'm only going to argue so much until I'm going to dead a conversation. Because we're not – and there's going to be – and he knows – I honestly believe that he's going to um, not um, – not, He's they're never going to forgive you. So there's no need to go back and forth. Just keep talking. And just like in any attempt, like right now we're going to talk about FSU, and I guarantee – I don't know what the over-under is going to be, but somebody's going to put 63-3 to three in the comments. It just happens. <laughs> and I can't argue every time I see 63-3 to three and think that I'm going to change that person's mind. At the end of the day, it happens. So – Whatever, but I did like the article, long story short. Yeah, the part that, you know, the key part of what he said there is Kirk feels guilty. So, okay, you feel guilty, but you're not apologizing. Basically, he just, he feels guilty that he's getting held accountable for his decisions because it was like, it's not a simple thing if it was asked, okay, what's your opinion here or there? The dude was on a little literal political campaign to get Bama in there and get Florida State out. He tried to, you know, his first attempts at apologies was saying, oh, it was just Jordan Travis's injury and all this stuff. But it started before the game Jordan Travis got hurt. So uh, all that stuff is it's just sour milk with with Kirk. He, he's never going to be able to make up for it. And they're never going to, you know, he's never going to do an apology that's going to su- suppress FSU fans. So he's just going to have to own it and get over it one day. Yeah, um, and, and as long as he does own his opinion, I don't have any issue with it. Like, I, the the his role is to give his opinions on college football, to analyze the sport on the field, and to give his opinions. And if he doesn't believe that Florida State should have been selected for the college football playoff, then that's that's his opinion. Now, you guys have obviously let it his rhetoric down a path in terms of uh, letting us know how a lot of his arguments didn't make sense because he spoke them after the fact. So that's, that's another thing. Like if he was on some kind of an agenda, then that's not, uh, not the right way to approach his job. But if he didn't think that Florida state was one of the four best teams in the country, then certainly he has every right to state that as an analyst. Without a doubt. I, again, it's not like you believe that this is the four best teams. Talk about the four best teams. I got you. No problem. The and, But even in his defense, like his defense of Michigan and a couple of them was, it was about better quarterback play, but then we saw some of the worst quarterback play that we've seen in college. I'm with you, Mark. I think his job is to, his job is to talk about college football. The problem is not, it's not even a problem. Like I think he keeps defending himself and there's nothing for him to defend. You said your opinion, just say it. The problem is he's like, Oh, well I, I like Florida state, but I just don't, don't bring them Guilty up. Conscience. That's Stop bringing them up. Like just goes forget to what show. they say to you. Every day, I'm mean, Mark. You probably you get the jokes is this for you on a smaller scale. Everybody calls you. Every fan base that isn't the one that you're currently doing one a, a thing on calls you a homer to that fan base. The worst thing you could do is go out and just keep defending yourself against the fan base. At a certain point, people are going to say whatever they want to say about you. And you just and Kirk Herbstreit is a big boy. He's he's one of he has reached the top when it comes to this. We know Kirk Hirsch. I grew like I grew up playing the NCAA video game, going waking up at eight a.m. on a Saturday. But when I I went from cartoons to college game day, that's what, like as a man. That was my growth as a man. Like we know you got this, dude. Just 
All right. You that's what you believe. You said what you believe. Move on. But I also look at it from this perspective. Man, you also know that every day you comment about this. You got a blue check mark. You have millions of followers. What better way for you to get that little like my check from Twitter ain't that big. But I don't have Kirk Herb Street's reach. And my check from the other ones are bigger. But what better way to get you another quick two, three thousand dollars that you can go spend on some BS? Ah, let me mention Florida State in this bowl game thing, but nobody asked me about anything. And I know it, it's it is not just Kirk. It's and this is where I've told I've, I've told Florida State fans this well before this when we weren't when we were at our version of mediocrity and other stuff. We are literally a beehive or a wasp nest, and people know that if I go and Flick it, I'm going to get all the attention and all the attraction that I need. And it's going to, it's going to stir the, it's going to stir the envelope. So, um, you know, it's, it, you know, it is what it is at the end of the day. And it, it's, nothing's changing. It's like arguing with a referee at a game. And when people are like, why doesn't the coach yell at it? Oh yeah. Cause in the history of sports, we have all seen the referee say, you know what? That guy cursing me out right now really is going to make me change my mind on the on on the on the flag that I've thrown and we've already moved the yards. At the end of the day, just hey ignore it. I know he's good at ignoring stuff, but I still like Kirk. I just think Kirk's I think I just like I, right now I as a bully or as a guy who knows that it gets under his skin, like I would probably mess with him just because I know it I know deep down it might not be the selection. Something about this bothers him. I don't know what it is that bothers him, but I know it does. And a lot of guys are going to continue to bother him until he just, again, gets over it or we win it or we get in, selected in the group of 12 this go around, which I told fans now, don't worry about it. Get over it because we win the ACC. It's in the rules now. Now, we may not get a bye week, but you got to put them in now. So. And he's still trying to find your time to your Allison thing because I'm like, it, I was really, it was like, I can't believe, I thought I bookmarked it, but I didn't bookmark it. I have now I'm starting to wonder if it was like the Mandela effect. Like, did it really, did I really see what I thought I saw? Because I can't, I can't find it anywhere. Yeah, no, he's, he's definitely at the top of the list of ops, but that Andrea Adelson article was really good. Uh, she's no Heather Dinich on my list of kind of ESPN commentators I don't appreciate, but, uh, she didn't exactly beat on the drum, but I did love this article. The part that really stuck out to me that I thought that was awesome from Mike Norvell and just goes to show the type of man that he is, uh, the type of, you know, you get the same guy from him all the time. You know, he's just 100 percent truthful when he opened up and he speaks about, you know, signing days two weeks after the ACC championship and selection Sunday. I mean, you have no time. Coaches, as soon as those conference championships are done, they got to hit the road and go recruit. Uh, so James mentioned that Heather, um, Andrea actually shared the text message that he sent out to the players, um, you know, telling them how he felt about the situation, how much he loves them uh, and appreciates them and kind of encourages them to not let it get him down and to keep working. Uh, but like you said, that was a text message. He had to hit the road. So he really contemplates, hey, you know, in the future, if something like that ever happens again, even though it was a rare circumstance, maybe I should have stayed. Maybe I should have sent my assistance out and I should have stayed with the team. Uh, maybe the Georgia game would have looked a little bit different. Maybe I could have helped some of their mindsets and different things going forward. So uh, I thought that was really awesome from him uh, and just goes to show how much he cares about his players. Um, and she really got into the part again, uh, like I think James is alluding to and that we talked about off show, like nobody ever, you know, gave the players a chance to like really speak their minds. Uh, it really goes into what Mike Norvell preached and what, you know, kind of the conventional wisdom has always been. They did everything. They checked all the goals, undefeated, conference champion. They kept pushing all those things and they just did not get the care. They didn't get a chance to compete. Um, so, you know, I don't blame Norvell for not trying to push them uh, to play in the game or whatever and just to appreciate them and all that. But it, uh, gotcha. it was a very good article that I, I want everybody to read and really kind of just made me respect Mike Norvell that much, uh, kind of how he talked about that whole situation and how it went down. I found it. He said, this is what Mike said. He said, December 4th, 2023. 
He's like, I'm so very grateful for you, and I'll never take one day for granted. But today we can stand up, stand tall, and go get better. A lot of ways to deal with adversity. You can stop, turn around, crawl under it, or try to avoid it. Keep your eyes up and climb over it. I love you guys more than, than you ever know. And do not let this world keep you from your potential because they are not in control of our best one day at a time. And then he said this um, it, for context. He put in an article, he's like, I tried to put my feelings out there for the team. I did it all through the week trying to help connect with guys and some things that they were feeling because I was feeling I was feeling them as well. We tried to do our best when we were, when you're not there. It's really hard. That's part of the gasoline of what made the time so hard. You're on a dead sprint, two weeks to sign a day, and we had to be in front of those kids too. But what if I would have stayed? It was a once-in-a-lifetime experience because it, it, it never happened to anybody else at our level, and obviously it will never occur again. I think through all those things, how could it have been better? And I think a lot of people, again, go to the thing where you you're, you lost your quarterback, and that was, that was a, a crucial – um, things. Jordan Travis, this team was not the same without Jordan Travis. Well, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of good you could get in a 63 to 3 butt whooping, which is, is what it was. But what I do tell people is when I saw the Brock Glenn, when I saw what happened in his development, even in playing in that game, statistically speaking, going up against a very dynamic Georgia defense, he put up better numbers than the two quarterbacks, like the, the Alabama the Alabama quarterback or the um uh the Texas um the way Alabama played Michigan he put up better numbers than us again not suggesting that he's better than them but what I would argue is right now everybody talks about Keon Coleman being a first round draft pick as a wide receiver at worst second everybody talks about Johnny Wilson possibly being a fourth round pick fourth to fifth same thing with Jaheim Bell you'd be you'd be you'd be arguing idiocracy or you'd be you'd be tr truly trolling if you don't believe because from what you saw that Keon Coleman Johnny Wilson and Jaheim Bell make a difference on that offense they do same thing with with um Trey Benson Trey Benson like, like when I went to the combine the one thing that everybody said leaving the combine was this these are NFL personnel these are media members this is this after seeing all those guys perform Yo, maybe I did get screwed. I didn't know these guys were that good. You don't have people write articles about 11 guys potentially getting drafted. You can't lose. I don't care if it would have been Georgia this year or Alabama or anybody. Nobody in one season can, without practice and being able to reload, can lose 11 guys before a game. Like, that's not how this works. It's very difficult. You're on your third stream defensive tackle you know what i expect to see an all sec dude to do to the third string d tackle of any program i expect to see him get ragged on I, I truly do expect that and they're a good ball club they're a good ball club that had that did not have any reason to hang their head because they did something that florida state did they lost they lost in the regular season they lost when they had their their opportunity to beat alabama nobody's going to say if georgia beats alabama that florida state would not be in that game instead Georgia's loss made them have to put Alabama in as well as the team that beat Alabama, which, again, no complaining to it. That's just what happened. But when you look at how fast the defense is, Renardo, you, Renardo Green, is, is. there's only two people. There's two people that are sending up the dra draft boards right now. They both went to LSU. That's Malik Neighbors, and I forgot the other wide receiver's name. I think it was Thomas. Was the Thomas. Very, very good wide receivers. I asked somebody, why are they ascending? Oh, well, they dominated the SEC is why they're ascending. I said, well, what game didn't they dominate? Well, you know, that was the first game of the season. And, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. but why are the guys who got who dominated the two best receivers in the draft, arguably, not ascending in the same way? And if you don't believe that Alabama has two better receivers than LSU's two better receivers, you damn right. I think Florida State might have been pretty good against Alabama in that game, not because of their offense, because the last three games of the season, they didn't perform well with the offense. The defense did it. And when we watched the games, there were great defensive matchups. That's what I actually enjoyed about some of the college football playoff games. So I, I say all these things to say is that like it's, it's what's done is done. But. I like the art. I like the article coming from the standpoint of how do you redeem it? How do you bounce back? 
and those guys did what was best for them. Um, I don't have any ill will toward any of those players who decided because they didn't come back to play in the Orange Bowl. They came back to play, shoot for a shot at the national championship, and they did. They checked all the boxes, and as everybody has said, and what makes it more, what made it bitter for Florida State fans is that it had never been done before, and there was opportunities to do it before. TCU, and then the argument that people used against Florida State was a team that won a playoff game. TCU, it was bad as their butt whooping the Georgia happened. They beat Michigan, if I remember correctly, to get there. And our, actually, two years before that, Michigan got their butts whooped in the national championship, too. You give, you, you, again, the argument is they didn't get a chance. They didn't get a chance. They didn't win it. Michigan won it. Michigan was a damn good team this year. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't, there's things I didn't think were great, but they're still a really, really good team. And, you know, but, We'll see going forward. Like, we'll have 12 teams. It's going to be blowouts and that. It's still going to be fun. But, you know, that's why I I do and I did like the article because, again, it, pay, it came from a different perspective. I, I really – that article right there um, published December 8th probably changes a lot, of, um, a lot of people's opinions on certain things. But it is a really, really good article. She just released it today. If you're an FSU fan. I encourage you to read it. If you're not, I mean, read it still. I mean, it's actually like again, it's very, very well written. She she had a good premise and a good and went with it. So, from an accountability standpoint, I contrast what you guys are describing out of Mike Norvell in that article versus your rivals head coach, his watershed public relations event of the year was not going to a knee against Georgia Tech to win a football game. And what did he do? He blamed the running back for not putting two hands on the ball. He said, oh, I didn't know that our offensive coordinator is supposed to know what the time. Da, da, da. Like he said everything but my responsibility. We teach two hands on the football, I think is what his first comment was. I blew it. My, my number one job on game day is to do everything possible to prevent us from losing a game. And I failed to do that. Yeah. But he didn't. Also, take I think it was the biggest that. troll he could potentially. I tell when Miami fans come at us and they say certain things, I, I say, you know what? I never realized how much, how diabolical you guys are. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, you guys hate us so much that you knew you had absolutely no chance to play in the national championship. So you lost games on purpose to mess with our strength of schedule. So now that the Miami win doesn't look great at all. I was like, man, I've never seen anybody that want that that's that's so hell bent on making sure we don't catch them with their rings that they'll lose on purpose, which is just my tongue in cheek joke. But accountability is a big. That's why even you, we've been doing this for time flies, Mark. We've been doing this for a while. But why? Even when I was critical of Mike Norvell, and the reason why I was critical. Is because I interviewed Mike Norvell and I've listened to Mike Norvell and I've gotten a chance to be around Mike Norvell. And one thing Mike Norvell is not as a loser. Mike Norvell can tell you, like, hey, it stinks that we lost. Actually, it was no less than 11. We lost 12 guys um, right before 12 of our start, our key players right before we played in that game. But he's like, we still coached the game and I still had guys on that field and there's still things that I could have done better. Like, that's like, he doesn't have that loser talk. When they were three and six, he's like, man, you're right. He's like, I don't, that's not what I signed up for. I was like, y'all didn't bring me in to go three and six. You didn't bring me in to go five and seven. And then what happened was he started winning. And even when they lost the three game stretch, I got to do better. I got to do this. Even though we like Mike can't help a guy coaching, throwing the interception. Mike can't help a guy dropping the pass. Mike can't do those things. But as a leader, as the leader of men, at the end of the day, the buck stops with you. And that's what made me, even in my critique, it's what made me always respect is that I feel like if he continues to do what he's supposed to do, it's going to turn around because he, he he's a owner, he takes ownership. And it reminded me of a guy who, again, a, a rival coach who won a lot of games for that rival, but he was, and now he did a lot of cheating, but like, you know, me and my son were watching um, the documentary um, over the weekend is um my uh is Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer said when he first took that job at Florida, 
He's like, I can't say these aren't my guys. These my guys, they, they became my guys the minute I signed that contract that paid me all that money. So those these are my guys. And that's kind of like the way that you that's the only way to win is is to take or the only way to get men to buy into you is for them to see that you have that level of accountability and you're not going to throw me under the bus the minute it doesn't go right. Even though it was the running back's fault, two hands, never fumble. Fumbles are inexcusable. Like I, I don't, I don't like fumble. I tell my guys where I coach at, what my position coach used to tell me is I call me, you ever fumble? Well, a couple of things. He said, you ever fumble that ball? I'm going to send you back to Rockbrook, which is the neighborhood I grew up in. And I wasn't going back to that neighborhood. And then he also said to a walk on, he said, if you fumble the ball, I want you to put on all your equipment, son. And I want you to run 85 all the way up to the top of the all 85 steps and just jump. No, nobody's worth two fumbles. <laughs> I said, geez, that it's extreme, it is, but I understood that day. I'd rather die than fumble the ball. And I never fumbled. So we didn't have a lot of fumbles when I played. Yeah, my last comment with the whole decision about the playoff is I'm on record about 10,000 different locations saying this. I in no way believe that Florida State was one of the four best teams in the country without Jordan Travis. However, I would have selected them to be in the playoff because they did what was required to go to the playoff. So my selection would have been pretty clear cut. You got three undefeated teams. You've got two other conference champions. They played. Texas beat Bama. you got three undefeated teams. you got four teams that go. I think that's kind of the simple. To me, that's the simplicity of it is, you know, you're not now, you know, or just state your intentions before we start. Don't change the rules to fit what you fit the narrative that you want. Like the job is who earned it. Like, you know, am I the best? Whatever. If I did everything, if I beat, if I did everything that I was I was supposed to do, and that everybody's qualified to do. Never mind. I won't. I won't say that that example I was about to use because that's all. That I can always get mud, muddy the waters. But if I'm better, then I should just be it. Um, you can't go. Don't go and change the rules. Because you you feel somebody else might be better. Um, and again, it's not that I think Texas, I like what Texas did with Sark, but that's the real messed up part is you change the rules, and neither team that you change the rules for got in. And that's the part that that's the only part that trips me out. And the justification was because of TCU, which I agree, TCU should never have been in the college football playoff. But they want they at least won the game and got the opportunity to get blown out of the national championship. But TCU didn't even win their conference. And they used the reason why is because of their full body of work moving into that game. So they lost their conference championship game and still was afforded an opportunity to play in the college football playoff. So we had two years, which again, I believe we got the rightful champion in, in the last two years. Michigan was the best. Michigan. I could argue if Michigan was the best team or not. Michigan won, and Michigan is the best team in the nation. Georgia won the year before, clearly the best team in the nation. I actually think Georgia last year was the best team in the nation too. But they didn't do what they were supposed to do to get the opportunity to earn it. I ain't crying about that. TCU probably shouldn't have been in there, but they got the opportunity to go in there. So, But I always tell people, what, one thing, and I told players, some of the players that, and they definitely didn't like it, it's part of life. Life don't always go the way you want it to go. Like sometimes you can do everything the right way and still not get in. Only thing you can't cry about it and don't what we used to say with don't let one loss turn into two losses or don't let two losses turn into three. Don't let one slight turn into a, a, a slide because at the end of the day, just win next year and you get in. Um, there's still things on the table that they, that those guys could have wanted. I just really. I kind of just really wish we weren't that good, like so that our guys could come back because those guys performed obviously for the next level. They performed at a high enough level to where they didn't need anything else to prove by playing Georgia, which kind of get put us in a in a bad spot. But I also don't blame Georgia. Georgia did everything you're supposed to do when an opponent takes that field. You're supposed to dominate them, 
supposed to whip their behinds, and I that was a solid that was a solid butt whooping. I can never get mad at a solid butt whooping.